Hi, it's Gene, retired in Mexico, and we ask one question on this channel, which is, do they write them and do they sing them like they used to? Now, a lot of people, young and old, they think the old music is better than the new, but I'm not so sure. And today, we're going to hit up a reaction channel that says the new music sucks. Okay? So, obviously, I'm going to have some rebuttals with this, but I do think the guy makes a couple valid points. So, I'm going to go through his ten reasons why new music sucks. And I'm going to stop after each comment and give my rebuttal or perhaps agree with him. So let's go ahead and hit this up. This is from Classic Album Review. And I'm going to be respectful. I'm not going to say that he's uh, full of crap or anything like that. Or, But if I think he's off base, I'll say that. And uh, so anyway, he's got his opinion and I'm, I'm going to try to be respectful. Um, so that's it. Let's go ahead and... Uh, hit this up so by the way I had a guy on the channel write me he goes he writes who the fuck says the new the old music is better who the fuck says the old music is better well here you go case in point exhibit A let's go ahead and hit this up welcome classic rock fans for a short and impromptu video but one that nevertheless asks a very pertinent question and that question is have you ever wondered why today's music just doesn't sound as good as it used to. But this question was put to me by my daughter who's been listening to a lot of classic rock recently and music suggested to her by Stranger Things, the Netflix series. She said to me, Daddy, why does today's music suck? Oh, from the mouths of babes and sucklings, eh? It seems that she's begun to recognize there was something intrinsically valuable missing from the pottage that is served these days. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said life without music is a mistake, but I never thought he'd envisage music without any life or life force to it. And I did forget to say, so what he's talking about here, uh, to be really clear, is he's talking about pop music. So he's not talking about all music. So if he's talking about pop music, a lot of pop music is bad, but it was back in the day, it was bad back in the day too. And I think he's a little nostalgic, so. Let's go ahead and continue. There was a time that rock and roll was very much a part of the youth culture, that spirit of rebelliousness. These days that seems to have been replaced by social media and uh, music now has been relegated to the soundtrack to their gaming. Oh, what a falling off was there. So how did we get here? I've outlined 10 reasons why today's music is so bad. Number one, songwriting by committee. Writers like uh, Max Martin and Lucas Gottwald, of course, who uh, had this endless conveyor belt of songs that has churned out for mass consumption and that conform to a specific pattern or formula. That's not to break the mold too much so as to establish what is considered to be good and appealing and stick to that. You might say to me, but hang on, was it music written by committee in the past? Um, you might use Motown as an example. Well, yes, it was, I guess, to a certain extent. The difference was this music was sung by singers who could actually sing, who knew how to sing a vocal line, how to approach a vocal line. It was played by real musicians. You could hear the, um, the buzz of the strings and the instrumentation. It had a humanity to it. So, uh, what I would say is he's talking about a very narrow kind of music here. But it reminds me of what Frank Zappa said. So, Frank Zappa was talking about school boards, but you could apply it to music. And he said by the time, you know, in this case he used the number 11. If you have 11 people who you have to get 11 people to agree on a textbook, uh, by the time they agree on a textbook to use in a class, it's a boring textbook. And what Frank Zappa said was that uh, in comes the nincompoop quotient. Isn't that a great phrase? The nincompoop quotient. So he's got a point here, uh, but he's talking very narrowly. And Motown, by the way, would often have three writers like Holland, Dozier, Holland. So they wouldn't have 11. But if, you have, if it takes 11 people to write a song, it's probably going to dumb the song down. And uh, songwriting by committee on pop music I think he's correct, actually, but again, he's talking about a very narrow um, bandwidth of music. So let's go ahead and hit it up, uh, his next reason. But yeah, I mean, he's got a valid point, but he's, like I say, he's, if he's trying to apply uh, 
songwriting by committee to all of modern music then he's off base but uh, in that one specific area he's got some valid points this brings us to our next point that's auto-tune auto-tune is something that's been dreadfully overused no auto-tune of course uh, it was very much thrust into the public consciousness by that uh, Scher song I believe but this was just a quirky production affectation this it was part of the aesthetic of the song but since then auto-tune has been used to cover a multitude of sins we've even artists using auto-tune live to uh, cover up any flubs or mistakes. It all lends the music a very artificial and processed feel, in my opinion. So that's number two. So what he's saying is his auto-tune is overused. Well, I think he's correct about that, actually. Um, auto-tune used to be, if you think of a band like Daft Punk, you know, they used it to effect. And now sometimes in the pop genre, Auto-tune is overused, and it is used to compensate for people who can't sing. So he's got a valid point. I hear songs where I'm just, I was uh, started to do a reaction to a Lana Del Rey song. And I got halfway through the song and I just hit stop record. I thought the song was horrible and did not like it. It was all auto-tuned. And uh, so he's got a point, but again, he's talking about a very narrow bandwidth of music he's uh, we don't hear auto-tune on most songs and there's in the first point he was saying that music uh, back in the day was by singers who could sing in that regard I think he's full of it you know there's lots of there's plenty of good singers he'll talk about that later uh, that's one of his ten points so let's keep going Number three is vocal delivery. Yeah. This is related to the above, of course. If auto-tune has to be used, you've got a whole generation of singers who just do not know how to sing. They don't know anything about vocal phrasing or how to deliver a vocal line. And the voices uh, lack nuance. They've become this homogenized drone, all in essence, to making the product appeal to the customer. Look at great voices from the past, the vocal pyrotechnics employed by Paul McCartney on his Ram album and the wonderful swoops of Dean Martin and... Uh... Whoops, what happened? What happened here? Well, okay, we're gonna pause the video and we'll come back to this. Okay, I moved indoors, so let's continue. Look at great voices from the past, the vocal pyrotechnics employed by Paul McCartney on his Ram album, and the wonderful swoops of Dean Martin and... Uh, um, the drunken rasp of Frank Sinatra, all these guys knew how to phrase things, how to approach a song and how to sing it, give it just exactly what it needs. Think about the sheer spit and power of somebody like Little Richard when, or James Brown when music really had balls, or that very bluesy rasp and uh, a melodic inflection of Paul Rogers. These were people who knew how to sing. Number. F so <laughs> he's out to lunch on this because there's always been good singers for centuries back, and there still is. So you're telling me Adele can't sing? Are you kidding? You're telling me Tom York can't sing? You're telling me Flora Janssen can't sing? Angel Olsen? Guy Garvey from Elbow? You're telling me these people can't sing? Come on. You know, he's uh, just in nostalgia here. And he's talking about phrasing. Uh, no, I, I don't think he's right at all. I mean, he's not right at all. So it, do, it doesn't make logical sense if you think about it. Like, talent is talent, and why wouldn't the new singers be talented? Uh, so let's keep moving on. He's just out to lunch on this. For his compression, uh, for the last 20 odd years or so, there's been this, uh, it's a phrase that's overused, I guess, but the loudness wars. I think it uh, in part comes when. Uh, uh, music moved from analog to digital. There was uh, there was this essence to increase the volume of everything, to over compress everything. They do this with commercials, of course, to make them stand out from the TV program. And they try to match the quietest part of the song with the loudest part of the song. So you get this splodge, really, that lacks any any dynamic range, any beauty, and that word again lacks any nuance. All this is done to make the song stand out. And it's done to the point of distortion as well. Number. F so I think he's got a point here. What I don't like is I don't like the mix. So when I make playlists on Spotify, 
I get one of these compressed songs that's mixed in with a very quiet song and it kind of drives me nuts and I try to go through the setting and normalize the volume but it only kind of works so I mean he's got he, he's got a point um, and, you know you don't hear this in classical music and other genres so I think the reason it's compressed is because some of us kind of like it a little bit but you know you vinyl files out there know what he's talking about he, he's got a good point which is some of the music just lacks the quieter moments uh, the way it's mastered and this happened maybe starting in the 90s and then really took off with streaming so that doesn't mean all the new music sucks um, you know he's ex, ex, uh, what's the word he's uh, extrapolating it's a nice hundred dollar word huh but uh, no, he's, but, but his specific point about some albums would be better if they were mastered a little differently. Um, yeah, sometimes it drives me nuts. So eh, yeah, he's got a point. I, I can't completely disagree with him. All right, let's keep going. Five is sheer variety, uh, that timbre, texture, and color that music used to have. The sounds within the music. I mean, songs have increasingly have less variety in terms of their instrumentation, the way they're sung. And instead of experimenting with different instrumentation and sound, they, they tend to use the same recording techniques. You think about some of the timbral and harmonic quality of some of those classic albums. But a lot of this has to, um, the blame has to fall uh, on, on record companies that just do not want to invest in or produce or look to produce great art anymore. And of course, so, I think he's off base except at the very end of what he said. So, you know, we just did a thing on Radiohead, and I was talking about how the string orchestra was asked to use guitar picks instead of violin bows. And, you know, the, the library of sounds today is richer than it used to be. And I hear all sorts of sonic things that you don't hear in the old records, so I don't really know what he's talking about. I mean, back in the day, it was guitar, bass, drum, and keyboards, maybe some horns. And today, you have all sorts of things at your disposal. So there are people creating really fresh sonic textures. I really don't know what he's talking about. But at the very end, he talked about the music business. And there, he has a point. Uh, so Spotify. Uh, I was watching a Rick Beato, uh, Rick Beato uh, interview and I can't remember the guy's name but he was really cool and he set out to Spotify in Sweden if if you say something about we're selling music the CEO if he walks by he'll stop you he goes no 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 we're selling subscriptions okay so I mean the suits have really taken over the business they're buying up everybody's catalog uh, all, all these songs are being used on commercials and Sure, there's a point there about the music business isn't as interested in developing new artists. I, I can't really argue with him on that. That's why most artists today are just going around the record labels, unless it's a really cool record label. There's several, several cool record labels. You think of Sub Pop or XL or Drag City. There's lots of independent labels that are still developing artists but the the big labels by and large in the streaming services only want to sell subscriptions so he has a point at the end there but the the bit about the sonic textures no nah, i think he's out to lunch all right let's keep going so you get those very samey voices or the same style of voices dished up to us in this banquet of uh, x factor and in pop. reality TV maybe shows in pop. And talent shows like that Record labels want to bet on a sure thing, and they're certainly not going to take um, any risks on, on developing an artist or any sense of individual vision that breaks from the mold. That's why you have Number TikTok. six is craft. I'm using the work uh, that went into something like uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the texturing and the layers of sound that went onto that record, overseen by uh, you know the brilliance of something like George Martin, Jeff Emmerich, you know, Brian Wilson, of course, that wonderful, wonderful pet sounds with that uh, remarkable band of musicians he worked with, the, the Wrecking Crew. And the best analogy to make here between the albums I've just spoken about and today's music is craftsmanship as opposed to mere assemblage. And many of these bands 
served an apprenticeship. They learnt their craft. You know, the Doors had their residency, the Whiskey a Go Go. The Beatles, of course, had their residency at the Star Club in Hamburg. And the Grateful Dead had the in room, so to speak. These guys learned how to construct and play music. So, you know, craftsmanship. So he's talking about two things here. He's talking about production and he's talking about playing. And I think with production, uh, sometimes there are economic constraints. But, you know, for the most part, production is just as vital and uh, exciting as it was back in the day. And if you have a preference for that sort of warm 70s production, if that's your preference, I, I, I can understand. But he's saying that anything newly produced is, you know, and he's, he's wrong. Now, there was a phase, okay? The 80s had all that synth pop, gated drums. In the 90s, we had a lot of the, the loudness that he was talking about. And uh, again, certain drum sounds that were recorded. Uh, some of it got kind of annoying, but we've come out of that in the 21st century. And production is a lot different than it used to be. And I like a lot of modern production. So I think he's wrong on that. Now, in terms of hitting the road and being in lots of bands and paying your dues, well, to talk about Rick Beato again, he talks about that. He's saying there's a plus and a minus to that. And the, the plus side is that if you do hone your craft on the road, you might have better chops. But the other side of the coin is this thing we were talking about going around record labels. I mean, you can make a song, upload it to, you know, some platform like TikTok, and it can go viral and become a big hit. And there's an aspect to that that's really cool, this um, DIY approach. Um, and we've listened to a little bit to some lo-fi recordings, purposefully lo-fi. and. Um, so I don't know, I, you know, the, the world is flat, as they say. Not, I'm not talking about flat earth society. I'm talking about that author that wrote a book called The World is Flat. And he was talking about how all the monoliths have been knocked down. And so the, what he's talking about here, I think it's a two-sided coin. And so yeah, he may have a, a point about your chops, but um, there's plenty of talented musicians uh many of them would shut at home or things like that so i don't know i think he's i don't think he's correct about this i think production today is pretty exciting and uh there's actually new tricks in the bag and the studio by the way is being used more and more as an instrument all the time and that's something really cool so i think he's living in nostalgia here number seven is instrumentation i mean i struggle to hear any it's swamped by this heavy, over-compressed bass sound. You can no longer hear the space or the distance between notes or the air that surrounds each musical note that's struck. Because at the end of the day, there is none. You listen to the bass that's uh, pumped out in these records and compare that to the, the bass sound that something like John Entwistle achieved with those Who records. Number eight. Uh, uh, instrumentation. Now, I don't think he's correct about that. So, um... <sighs> You know, though sometimes it is. I mean, we have to understand there's more volume today. There's more music today. So if you want to find bad music, you can find more examples of it, right? Just by sheer numbers. There's more songs being uploaded all the time than ever before in the history of music. Um, but I think for the most part, he's, he's, he's wrong. Um, now, space, you know, you think about, oh, I don't know, uh, Pink Floyd or somebody or Miles Davis were masters of space. And then I listened to someone like Florence and the Machine today. And I will admit that for my ears, her music is a little too busy with too many instruments crowded in there. So there's examples of what he's talking about, but he can't make a sweeping statement like that. There's plenty of music with space and perfect balance of instruments and yeah, uh, well-recorded bass, so, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't agree with him on this point at all. Uh, just maybe ever so slightly with certain bands, but, uh, nah. Relates to the point I've just made is the over-reliance on drum and bass. It just drives any intricacy and delicacy from or individuality from this music. You listen to something like Steve Gadd's drumming on 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. I mean, the... It's just remarkable. Everything has just been deadened 
by this incessant thrum. Number nine is the lyrical content of this music. So on that drum and bass comment he made, uh, if he's talking about pop music, uh, you know, there's a certain monotony to the top ten playlists and, uh, you know, those trap beats and and some predictable sounds, but uh, if, if he's only talking about the pop songs that are made and marketed, you know, to top. So people, um, you know, the masses, they like that, but it was the same back in the day. So this is a good time to talk about something I was thinking of when I first watched this. You know what the number one song of the 1970s was, the best-selling single of the 1970s? It was Debbie Boone, You Light Up My Life. You don't hear that on oldie stations anymore. That song sucks, you know? I mean, I got so tired of hearing that song. They used to play it on the radio all the time. and So I think he's being nostalgic because... Um, you know, the reason that song was so popular, what I'm getting at here, is this was a song that appealed to the masses that the most number of people liked. Well, that's always going to be true with the bell curve, right? You're always going to have the bell curve and you're going to have this area where pop music exists where a lot of people are like, yeah, I kind of like that. And so, you know, we're in that same phenomenon now, but it hasn't changed. It really hasn't. Um, though, he, you know, he's talking about, the, the, so the bass and the drum too, I, I gotta say that I think a lot of that came from, somewhat from electronic music, but also from rap. So a lot of the bass and drum and then later dubstep and things like that, but people like that bass and drum. And when he knocks that, he's kind of knocking a, a genre a little bit. I'm not saying it's a racist statement. But uh, drum and bass was uh, big in R&B and later rap music, and I don't know. I think that's a, a dangerous statement to make. Um, to me, it depends on the song and the recording, but sometimes I like drum and bass dudes, so, you know, especially that electronic music in the 80s. I loved techno, still love techno. Uh, rave and techno and all that stuff in the 90s that was kind of post-grunge. Man, I love that stuff. So, no, I would not agree with him. I guess there's always been silly and twee songs, of course, but yes. uh, this music is, again, it's produced, it's like a conveyor belt that produces music with specific hooks in specific places that capture the listener's attention, because God forbid they'll just skip to the next song. I remember a day when you had to invest in music, you bought that slab of vinyl and you stuck it on your record player and you had to listen to it to the end. Nostalgia. Not that you had to, God forbid, you actually had to get up and cross the room. Number 10. So, yeah, lyrics. I, I think he's wrong, though. I, You know, maybe just a tad in his defense. Lyrics are getting harder to write because so much good stuff has been written. So if you're a new artist today and you want to create something new and novel, it's a tougher game for you. Right? So, but I think for the most part he's wrong. Um, what I will say is with modern music, there's, because of all the music there is, there's maybe less gatekeeping and um, maybe more average lyrics get, get out there. But uh, for the most part, he's just really full of it here because we had really bad songs back in the day. We had, we had to listen to Rod McEwen. We had to listen to songs like Me and You and A Dog Named Boo and Candy Man by Sammy Davis Jr. and Daddy Don't You Walk So Fast by Wayne Newton. We had horrible songs. And then you look at today's music, Guy Garvey from Elbow, one of the best lyricists in rock history. Love Guy Garvey's words. Tom York, great lyric writer. Um, we've been uh, checking out King Gizzard. There's some good lyrics with them. So. Yeah, I think he's cherry picking here. Um, yeah, cherry picking. There's plenty, plenty of good lyrics, and I, th I think he's off base there. So I hope what I said wasn't controversial. I'm just saying that there's a lot of product out there. So if you want to find, and, and, and when I say average lyrics, let's understand this is math. I think mathematically. If there's 10 songs 
and one of them in the middle, well, there wouldn't be one in the middle with 10, 11 songs, one in the middle, half the songs are going to be below average. I mean, that's just math, right? That's statistics. So, you know, there's a lot of subpar lyrics out there, but there always was. So again, I think he's in nostalgia here, and I don't think this is correct at all. His audience, an audience that's been absolutely bludgeoned, uh, brainwashed, I don't want to use that term, but uh, by having this music pumped out consistently to the point where it just becomes this colourless wallpaper of sound. It's pumped out in shopping malls and shops, on the internet, gaming, TV series. It's what psychologists call the mere exposure effect, where people are, it's a psychological phenomenon where people just develop uh, a preference for things that they hear often and hear all the time. And you've got to look at the chemistry of that as well. Our brains release dopamine when things, uh, our pleasure centers are activated by things that we feel comfortable with, familiar. And that is why I think today's I what music his background really is. deviates from the formula. You might just say that I'm a middle-aged bloke complaining about today's music. May so on the audience there, well, what can I say, you know? Um, yeah, I guess you used to have to go to the record store on the release day of the album and actually buy it and take it home and tear the shrink wrap off of it. And today you can just download it. And so there is a simplicity and convenience to music today. And so this has affected me. Okay, this has affected me in my life. I used to have to invest more than I, than I do now. Hey, dude, that's part of the modern world. It doesn't mean people don't still like the music. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, he said we've been bludgeoned. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, Marshall McLuhan wrote a lot about, he kind of predicted this, that the media would overwhelm us. And how many of us drive down the road past 100 billboards and maybe we noticed one of them? You know, there's so much information, information overload in the modern world. Yeah, sure, and it's in everything. It's in advertising and television and, like I say, driving on the road. And it can't help but affect our attention spans a little bit. But come on, guy, you know, the convenience is nice. And since I started streaming, um, I have sold off part of my record collection. I used to have a lot of music and I've taken a portion of it and sold it off because, you know, and downsized, which is really nice. I like downsizing. And so have audiences changed? Well, I think the cell phone has changed the concert going experience. He didn't mention that, but, um, I don't know. I'm going to sound like an old codger here. I don't mind phones at concerts, but I might have had a preference for when we didn't have phones. But the point is, is that I still want my phone. And guess what? I'm a hypocrite because I pull my phone out and I film things that I watch as well. So, and upload it to Facebook and, hey guys, look at this concert I saw. So, yeah, I'm guilty as charged. And uh, so maybe I'm conflicted about it, right? So, um yeah, I, you know, there might be just a, a slight touch of truth to what he's talking about, because now he's not talking about music. He's not talking about the music business. He's talking about us. He's talking about the concert goer and the music consumer. Yeah, we've all changed a little bit. But, I mean, don't you like binge watching a show instead of having to wait every week and check the TV guide? Oh, my God. You know, we used to look in the TV guide to see when a show was going to air. And if you weren't on the couch when that show did, then you had to wait until next year for reruns or syndication. So I'll take the modern world. Come on. You know, if I want to watch the first year of a Netflix series, I can binge watch the whole thing. So I don't know. Dude, it's a trade off like a lot of things. There's pluses and minuses. And it's the modern world. So I've said here before, I'm trying to live in the present day, the present moment, and the present year. This, this guy's not in the present year for sure, but he admits it. Let's hear the last bit of his talk here. Maybe, maybe, but I'll be honest with you. I, I see something very sinister 
in the way music has been appropriated in the way today's youth are just not tapping into that feral power that music once offered. The singer-songwriter Billy Joel said uh, music uh, should be an explosive expression of our humanity. I hear very little in what is real or lived experience in, in what is churned out these days. Anyway, you may fundamentally disagree with everything I've said and that's absolutely fine. Please leave your comments below. Uh, I'll urge you to click like, subscribe and check that bell to get notified. So yeah, I, you know, so we'll wrap this up. I think you guys um, can see that he's uh, being a little bit nostalgic or a lot nostalgic really. So I just wanted to play this because, hey, you know, exhibit A, here's a guy who says the old music is better than the new music. And my channel is all about being in disagreement with that. So I appreciate you guys joining the channel here. And uh, I guess in conclusion, I'll just say, you know, he's got a, a couple minor points here and there that that I can concur with. But, um, you know, and but pop music, here's what I really want to say is pop music. It was bad back in the day, a lot of it, you know. So uh, sometimes it was kitschy, you know, you're listening to Afternoon Delight or something like that, which is kind of harmless, but there were a lot of uh, radio songs that were excruciating, and I think he's just kind of glossing that over and romanticizing the past. Because if you look at the, pla if you look at the past with a clear looking glass, it shouldn't be that different than today. It should be times of happiness, times of sadness, times that were painful, times that were joyous. And if you kind of rewrite the past, that's a dangerous place to go. As you guys know, I'm not a big nostalgia fan, so I prefer to be here with you listening to modern music. So thanks for hanging out with me. And as we say here in Mexico, buen dia.